A lot of people dream of uh, riding in the shuttle, and for one of the nation's teachers, that dream will be coming true. NASA will soon be looking for the shuttle's first citizen passenger. John? That's right, Dave. As you know, all kinds of people have applied to fly on the shuttle. Doctors, entertainers, writers, TV news anchors. And yesterday, President Reagan announced his decision. But today I'm directing NASA to begin a search in all of our elementary and secondary schools and to choose as the first citizen pastor in the history of our space program, one of America's finest, a teacher. NASA will announce in October how a teacher may apply to make shuttle flight. The process will start by every state selecting two elementary or secondary school teachers who meet the basic medical standards. The teacher who's finally picked to make a flight will be given eight weeks of basic training and then will be assigned to NASA for one year after the flight. The purpose of that, to describe the experience to other educators and students. School teachers with wide eyes and big grins are learning the ropes at Johnson Space Center, all in hope becoming the school teacher, the one which will fly aboard a spaceship. The teachers are here to learn, but it is clear one thing they already know, each wants to go to space. Of course, they all wanted to go to space before, but now that the possibility of that is very real, well, well, just ask the teachers. I think there's a lot out there that we don't have and we don't know. I think that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what in reality is the new frontier. The future is there. It really is. And this is just the first step. This is like man leaving his cradle. He's going to go out to the stars. I really think we're going to get there someday. And I, I want to do this so that I can come back and just give some of these experiences to my kids. These are the space age people. Their children are going to be possibly living on space stations. They're going to have all of these new frontiers. And, and for teachers to come back with that excitement, I think they're really going to benefit from it. Do you remember when they sent the first chimpanzee up on that rocket? Well, I thought it should have been an elementary school kid named Barbara Radding. I really wanted to be the one up there. And I've been interested ever since. But the thing I can do out there, and that's get kids excited to watch out there and see why this frontier is so valuable. To be up there and to look back at the planet Earth, I just, it's an ultimate trip. It's the ultimate experience of a lifetime. My students are going to benefit from it. I'm going to benefit from it. Other teachers with whom I work will benefit. And when one teacher circles the globe next January, millions of kids around the country are going to be looking up to teachers in more ways than one. The children entering kindergarten this fall are going to be in the job market through the first half of the 21st century. And I want to make sure a teacher's there to help convey to educators what skills are needed to help those children survive in that kind of future. NASA officials will pick a finalist and a runner-up before the end of the month. The winner will go to space in January. At Johnson Space Center, John Getter, Channel 11 News. In Houston, John Getter for CBS News, Southwest. Even though they just arrived this week, the teachers have already had their share of prodding, poking, testing, and running. It's all part of the screening process that will eventually lead to one of the group making history. Richard Methia, the teacher from New Bedford, Massachusetts, was tested on Monday from 6.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night. But even the flight bag, he says, was fun. Did you enjoy that uh, big basketball they stuck you in yesterday? Absolutely, 36 inches of pure pleasure. Because it reminded me of my being a kid. I was back in, uh, back in a dark room on a cold winter night with a blanket over me, and it was comfortable and it was warm. It was really a pleasant experience. It was a lot of fun. In fact, two of my colleagues actually fell asleep during the test. Peggy Lafleyan, the teacher from Friendswood, drew a lot of media attention. Earlier, she was put through the pulmonary test and paced on the treadmill. I see the role as a teacher in space as being one where you share the experience using some of the problem-solving skills that students need for the future. Mm -hmm. And I feel so strongly about it that I hope that's an idea they are interested in. Just who is selected will be decided ultimately by NASA Administrator James Beggs. The decision is expected July the 19th. The finalists here with me and the more than 100 semifinalists will all in the months ahead serve, as Jim has said, as a link between NASA and the nation's school system. These teachers have all received special NASA training to pass on to other teachers and to their students. And together, they and NASA will be a part of an exciting partnership for quality in education. So let me tell you now who our teacher in space will be. And let me say, I thought I was a world traveler, uh, but this uh, 
tops anything I've tried. And first, the backup teacher who will make the flight if the winner can't, Barbara Morgan of the McCall Donnelly Elementary School in McCall, Idaho. Barbara has been a teacher for 11 years. She first taught on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana. She currently teaches second grade. Congratulations. And we have a little, uh, a little thing for And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Where's that you? <laughs> Krista teaches in Concord High School in Concord, New Hampshire. She teaches high school uh, social studies. She's been teaching for 12 years. And you too get one of these. Uh, it's, it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. When that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. Next on Headline News. Air Education, Sharon McAuliffe's been picked to fly on the space shuttle Challenger next January. Ten teachers were in the running to have a high-flying winter vacation. And Mrs. McAuliffe says she hopes her space it's, it's travels will have a positive effect here on Earth. Oh, it's marvelous. It's just been wonderful for the teaching profession. Just the elevation that is that has taken place now with the role of teacher, I'm really hoping that there will be more people who will be encouraged to go into the teaching profession. Disappointed. On the other hand, I was happy in meeting these ten teachers, the nine other teachers, that they were all very well qualified, and I have no regrets of the two they chose. And I'll know that even though I'm not personally on the shuttle, some of my ideas may be going up on the shuttle, and, and that's rewarding to me. From what Krista McAuliffe said, there will be more involvement for the other finalists. Will you be coming back to Washington? and taking part in preparing lesson plans? Yes, in, in August, uh, the week of August 13th, we'll all be coming back to work together to get those final lesson plans ready to go in space in, in the areas of science, humanities, and one other wild card area we haven't determined yet. So we're going to be soliciting ideas from our other 104 candidates who are here in Washington early and other teachers around the country to try and get the best possible lesson plans to reach the kids out there in the United States schools uh, and the actually schools around the world. Uh, they also alluded a little bit to the fact that the eight of us would be offered an opportunity to work with NASA this next year, uh, not exactly as a consulting uh, position, but an exchange position where we would like to work with them, they would like to work with us. We know a lot about education in the classroom, they know a lot about technology in space. We uh, talking with uh, Mr. Beggs and Ann Bradley, the assistant, is uh, which, which one of the centers I might go work with so that I could still have that opportunity to get the kids linked up by computer. Uh, that's one of the things we'll be doing the next month. The, the ten of us will all be working together, trying to put the best possible package together. I was disappointed. I really did want to go. Uh, however, I realized uh, the ten of us were all equally qualified. NASA had to, obviously what they wanted uh, in the teacher who would fly, so you know I had to go with that. And I'm hoping to be a support person who can still offer some some information and still get those ideas up on the shuttle. Well, I, I felt I did wind up at the top. All ten of us felt we were equally at the top, and uh, we were very excited when we found out uh, Krista and Barbara were the two who they chose, and the, the, ten of, the other eight of us are going to be supporting them. We'll be actually writing the lesson plans that they take up there, and NASA did offer all eight of us uh, jobs to work with them this next year. I'll be uh, deciding that this rest part of this summer on whether I'll take them up on that opportunity to come back. And my career choice is the fact that, that I chose teaching. I'm, you know, I, I do enjoy teaching. I look forward. for four days and I saw a few of them and they were really excited they were of course juniors and seniors I saw a lot of them in, in different places working and hanging out of cars you know tooting their horn as they went by the house they're real excited about it Krista, what do you think set you 
Why do you think you're here and your colleagues are behind you? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. Um, we thought long and hard about it and felt that the committee almost had to put everybody's name in a hat and pull. I know that they did not do that and they used other criteria, but I've got nine strong teachers behind me right now and any one of us are, is well qualified to do this. And what they gave you no hint? Most about going into space? I'm sorry? What are you looking forward to most about going into space? Seeing the Earth, seeing the perspective of the Earth and just being able to um, to see the planet, I mean, you see it in pictures, but to be able to see that in reality is going to be wonderful. What made you think that you'd be uh, a good astronaut? Oh, well, I, I'm not. I'm not an astronaut. That's not what I, uh, what I am. I'm a space participant. I'm not going through the training astronauts go through. I certainly didn't go, although it was an extremely extensive physical, I didn't go through um, the physical that the astronauts would go through. It really is a different category. I do plan to go back to teaching. This is not a career, but it's an unbelievable experience. What will you do now between uh, the time the shuttle takes off? Well, hopefully go home and <laughs> make some contact with my community, and that really has to be discussed. I know we're going to be planning lessons from the 13th to the 15th. The 10 of us are going to be in Washington again, devising three lessons from that are going to be actually taught aboard the shuttle, one in humanities, one in science, and one that hasn't been decided yet. And also we're going to be dealing with five classroom lessons so that we can share this experience with as many people as possible. Will you ever be an ordinary teacher? <laughs> well, probably an ordinary teacher, but, t but touched by an extraordinary experience. <laughs> what are you looking forward to the least of what's going to happen? Um, probably being away. I just have that I haven't done before, and that's something that um, being away from my family and being away from teaching. I haven't um, gone yet without starting a school year. That's going to be a real strange feeling. The woman with the right stuff is 36 from Concord, New Hampshire. She teaches social studies to 11th and 12th graders at Concord High School, has a master's degree in education, is a wife and mother of two. One of the things that I hope to bring back into the classroom is to make that connection with the students that they too are part of history that the space program belongs to them and to try to bring them up with the space age in a week of screening at the Houston Space Center McAuliffe and the nine other finalists became a close-knit team more gung-ho on space than ever but why McAuliffe was picked over the others NASA didn't say one hint she intends to keep a diary of her experiences in space I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks when that shuttle goes, there might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. The nine who didn't win have said all along that losing wouldn't make them any less enthusiastic about space. They will help NASA design a space studies curriculum and will continue to promote space flight. Ordinary Joe Blows are going to be doing, and I'm an ordinary Joe Blow, and I think this is going to show that anybody can go up in the space shuttle, that anybody can be part of our space program and part of our future. When one teacher circles the globe next January, millions of kids around the country are going to be looking up to teachers in more ways than one. And teachers will be able to look up at one of their own and see themselves with new pride. Martha Teichner, CBS News, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Ten finalists in NASA's Teacher in Space competition, anxiously awaiting Vice President George Bush's well, announcement here's, here's of the backup the and the winner. Then, as in true beauty contest style, Bush awarded the runner-up trophy to Barbara Morgan of McCall, Idaho, to fly on the shuttle flight next January if the winner can't. And then Bush came to the winner. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. And you, too, get one of these... Uh, it's it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words i know my students wouldn't think so i've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks and when that shuttle goes there might be one body <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that i'm taking with me thank you that's great and indeed, the other semifinalists return to Washington in the next few weeks to help McAuliffe work out lessons for students during the flight. But that's in the future. For now, Krista McAuliffe was overcome by tears of joy at her victory. Jules Bergman, ABC News, Washington. It's hard to say. There were so many people. All ten of us were excited about teaching. We love the students. We're good communicators. 
I almost felt that the committee was going to have to put our names in a hat and, and just pick one out. Was there any one thing that you said or did or anything that you think may have made your application stand out? Well, in my application, not only am I very active in my community, but I also feel that fostering a real good national and international awareness is, is real important in students' lives. I also made my shuttle project something that everybody could identify with, a journal, uh, a diary, something that would connect the ordinary person to the space age. In other words, that's what your shuttle project is something that you have to do on the flight, right? That's correct. And so you outlined all of this in your application? Yes, we had to propose a project, and I wanted something that was unobtrusive, it wouldn't get away with the mission, something I could do. I'm not a science person, I'm not math inclined, so I needed something, because I'm a historian, that would tie in with my classroom. A journal seemed very, very easy, something that again would connect the students to history, and I also um, have been developing a course called The American Woman. And it's a social history. It deals with the common, everyday people behind the military and the political and the economic events. So in this way, it would also tie in with my course. Well, how do you see that tying in? I mean, what is your experience in space? How is that going to relate to down-to-earth problems? Well, we always see the astronauts. They are technologically wonderful. They, they do their scientific experiments. But that is their career. We don't really see space as a frontier as a new way of living and in our classrooms all teachers have to really identify students with different types of careers what I wanted to do was to give the ordinary person's perspective to really show them that there was a new way of living out there and I think that that will be that connection I really hope the students get excited about the space age because they see me as an ordinary person up there in space and maybe can explain some of the things that the astronauts really either haven't taken the time because they're very busy with their experiments or maybe just for me to see it in a different light. Some cynics have suggested that this whole thing is just a publicity gimmick for NASA. Obviously with the project that you plan to do, you don't share that view, is it? Obviously NASA is going to get some good publicity and I don't have any problem with that at all. The money that they have expended, though, has raised the level of teaching as far as the role of the teacher. They're going to have a wonderful PR, and that's true. But I also think it's exciting students about a way of life that's part of their future. They've got to get ready for this. Their grandchildren are probably going to be on space stations. There are going to be totally different fields. I mean, there, there's going to be space law. There's going to be um, business in space. And students have to prepare for that future, and I think this will help them do that. Um, the training will start um, in September. Did you think that you were ever going to fail in any part of the testing? Um, um, no, that wasn't really part of the evaluation process. So even if I had gotten sick on it, I would, I'd still be all right. Were you surprised by the testing or anything? Did you think it was harder than... Yeah, the intensity of it, just lots and lots of things crammed into a week. I mean, we were just running from early in the morning to late at night. Do you think that was part of the training or the testing? Well, maybe, but I think they were also, they knew that we only had the, us for a short period of time, and they were just trying to cram it as much as possible so that we could really experience everything that we could in that, that short period of time. Scott said today you were going to take one of his pet frogs along on the flight. Is that going to be one of the pieces of the car? Yes, we're going to put that frog right on the shuttle. This is... This is Scott. Yeah, does, Scott. The frog, does the frog have a name yet? Yeah. Yeah. Legal. Legal. <laughs> Legal the frog is going to go into space? Yeah. That's part of the deal. Does NASA know about this? I, have, I do have a personal compartment on board the shuttle. I can't take some things along with me. I'm not big enough for any of you. But. Actually, have you seen the inside? You must yeah. have seen the inside yeah. of one of these things. Yeah. A personal compartment. How yeah. comfortable it's, is it? It's probably about this big and about that size so that you can bring some of the, some things that you, you know, you like to bring. Yeah. What kind of t-shirt you're going to wear? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to get a good New Hampshire one. Can you tell us about the camaraderie between you and the other nine finalists? Oh, it's just wonderful. It really is. I mean, we went through so much. And all I can liken it to is um, having a, a small bunch of people kissing. <laughs> <laughs>
Kristen, finally, what's it like? <laughs> Where's Kitty Pop? Oh, she's resting. Oh, she's resting? Oh. Who's with her? Oh. <laughs> now it's 20 seconds. A long 20 seconds. Is this like a countdown? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Dion, Kristen is here with me now. She just got off the plane a while ago, and I know that you were chosen for this mission partly because of your disposition. You've been giggling since you got here. Tell me. Why, again, you've said it so many times, why is this so important to you, making this trip on the show? Well, it's important for a lot of reasons, but I think the most important thing is to humanize the space age to a point where everybody feels a part of it, and the students really connect with that. They're the wave of the future. They're the ones who are going to have to deal with the space stations and beyond, and I really hope and feel that it's part of the teaching profession to bring those new career opportunities. I know, it's wonderful. Okay, all right, so how's it feel to be back in New Hampshire? It feels great to be home. I am really delighted because I kept hearing about all of these wonderful things that people were doing while I was down in Washington, while I was down in Houston, and I couldn't share with that. You know, and Steve would tell me on the phone, and he'd say, you know, you got some letters, or, you know, people called, and, and I couldn't share with that. So I'm really glad I'm home. How long are you going to be home for? Well, hopefully I'll be home on and off for about a month, so I'll, I'll be able to spend some time in New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah. I gotta ask you, when did you find out? Did, did you find out just before the announcement, or? Yeah, we did. We asked as a group, um, we requested that we find out prior to going into the room. It was a small room, there were a lot of press there. We've invested an awful lot of emotion in these last two weeks, and we really felt that we needed to find out and compose ourselves before walking into the room. So we did, we did know when, before we walked in. What were your feelings when you found out? <laughs> well, it was, it was rather funny when, when we were talking about um, uh, what was happening at home, and, and I was saying something to the effect that, you know, well, you know, when I'm not home, and, and I said, my husband really relies on cornflakes and milk, because that's kind of his staple. <laughs> and Ann Bradley turned around, and kind of, not, without missing a beat, she turned around, and she said to me, while the whole group was together, she said, I think you better buy some more cornflakes and milk. <laughs> Those ten souls, of course, belong to Krista and the nine other finalists who competed for that one special seat reserved for a teacher on next January shuttle flight. Krista McAuliffe has joined us here this morning. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Frank. Simple question. Why you? <laughs> it's really hard to say. There were 10 people. We were such a cohesive group, enthusiastic, really enjoying teaching, and I think any one of us would have done a really good job. I don't know what put me over the top, and I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> when you first applied for this, did you think you had even a prayer? I really didn't. I was almost doing it kind of like when you play the lottery. Uh -huh. If you don't play it, you don't win. Sure. And when I filled out that application, that's really how I felt. I figured there'd be at least 50,000 people across the country who would be slipping that into the mailbox <laughs> around the same time. What about did. when you made it down to the last 10? Did you think then, maybe? Well, then the possibility became very real, and I really started to think what the impact would be on my teaching career and on my family. Yeah. But it was still really exciting. <laughs> Has it all hit you yet? No, no, I don't think so. I still can't believe that I'm going to actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Maybe when I'm on the launch pad it will. What are you most excited about? Seeing the Earth from that perspective of, of that small planet, you know, it, it's such a big place here, but being able to look at it from a new perspective, and I hope I can bring that wonder and that excitement back to the students. Maybe just a little bit of, of fright, too? Not yet. Um, maybe when I'm strapped in and those rockets are going off underneath me, there will be. But space flight today really seems safe. Um, we had a good example of that when um, NASA shut down the last one through the computer because one of the backup systems wasn't working. Mm. You say it seems safe. A lot of people equate that with it also seems boring. Have you been one, <laughs> have you been one who followed NASA efforts all along, long before? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I can remember watching the vanguards as they went like this, and I remember um, Alan Shepard's first suborbital flight, and it was mm. really thrilling. I read where you said you wanted to demystify space. In, in, uh, in, in plain talk, what does that mean? Well, we, we see the space program as a science or math or technological um, adventure right now. I want the students to get a little bit of ownership. I want them to feel that they're part of the space age because they're the future and their children or grandchildren are going to be pioneering that. Mm -hmm. So I really hope to bring an ordinary person's perspective to this. Have you heard from some of your students yet? Yes, I have. They've been dropping by the house. They've been sending me cards. They've been calling. That, that's been super. 
NASA, of course, has a selfish interest in all this. I mean, they want to build up public support for sure. the huge outlays that are necessary to keep the program going. As part and parcel of being the first ordinary citizen, I mean, are you expected to be the ordinary speaker who's out there um, well, making speeches on NASA's behalf? That's going all to come. Along? certainly will, but I, I'm also delighted that the teaching profession and students and um, the whole country is really going to benefit from this. We hopefully are going to know an awful lot more about what life is like aboard the shuttle. Yeah. You go up on January the uh, 22nd. That's of, what the, of, the date is, yes, Of 86, right now. And, and we're hoping that that'll, <laughs> that'll be met. What are you most concerned about between now and then? Well, probably just getting my life in order. I do have a family in Concord, New Hampshire, and I have to get them set. I also want to make sure my replacement in school sure. is going to be comfortable for next year. Any thoughts, however slight, that you might not measure up once it gets going? Well, one of the things that has been really surprising is all of the, the publicity. And I was saying to my husband the other night, it's almost like I'm reading about somebody else, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a dream come true for you. Oh, it certainly is. Krista McAuliffe, congratulations. Thank you again. Good luck. We'll see you in January. Thank you. This excited, nervous school teacher is polishing the lesson she will teach from outer space. Here, so I can explain to the kids <clears throat> that everything has to be held down because otherwise... School children from all over the country will tune in on public television. Quite a change from a year ago, but our biggest audience was the social studies class at Concord High School in New Hampshire. Uh, McAuliffe luck, became one of America's best-known teachers when she was picked from more than 11,000 applicants to be the first private citizen to get a ride on the shuttle. I thought there was never going to be any more excitement. I mean, I could never peak any higher than I had on July 19th, and it just keeps building. <laughs> She hopes her trip is going to spread the idea that space is for everyone, and especially the students in today's classrooms. Oh, that's great! I love it! had to become a student all over again, learning how to be an astronaut, where a sleek T-38 jet can serve as the study hall. It's wonderful. He broke the sound barrier, and he let me fly for a while. There were many lessons to be learned, fighting fires, and driving the emergency escape vehicle. There are a lot of students back at Concord High School who would love to have that opportunity. <laughs> she has become a hero back in Concord, and her husband has become a space enthusiast. If I could nudge her aside and climb board, I think it'd be a fight. <laughs> and there's also a little competition from daughter Caroline. I think it's neat to go into outer space. This doesn't seem possible. It was an emotional experience as she watched the launch of the shuttle last October. It's beautiful! She thinks it will be even more beautiful when she can share the experience with the nation's school children. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. And on the subject of going up there, the next mission of the shuttle Challenger is scheduled for Sunday. The astronauts arrived at the Cape today, and yes, this will be the one with the teacher on board. Here's ABC's Lynn Scher. Morning, and that was a thrill. When she left her classroom behind for a semester of space training, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe temporarily traded 12 years of teaching for a new kind of learning. Listen to her description of the airplane ride that simulates zero gravity. As you peak that parabola at the top, you have about 20 or 30 seconds of weightlessness, and all of a sudden, just like Peter Pan, you start flying up, and it was just unbelievable. That's the enthusiasm that's made her a favorite of students at Concord High School in New Hampshire. This is where the Boston-born social studies teacher lives with her husband and two children, and where she put together her winning lesson plan. It's clear from her NASA application that Krista McAuliffe took special care to relate her classes here at Concord High School to what she calls the real world. Her philosophy of teaching, she wrote, stresses community activities. The economics class finds out how local construction projects impact the city. Law classes visit the local courts. She can take very complex um, concepts and simplify them, but not water them down. And it make her, she makes all her students understand things, but in an interesting manner. She was explaining like the assembly line process, and she went into this this story about when um when she used to package Twinkies on an assembly line. And I mean, I just laughed so hard, but I'm not gonna forget it. <laughs> That's also what helped her application stand out among the 11,000 NASA received and what changed her life. The teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Suddenly, she was a celebrity. McAuliffe and her family were paraded along Main Street and featured on the front page. 
When she reported to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, she was poked and prodded and outfitted and observed. She's a sort of a risk taker. Uh, she does the unusual, um, the way she runs a class, and, and she's not afraid of things. She, she, she lives life. She's not afraid of it. Teachers are always prepared. <laughs> and while she taught history and economics, her students figured out there was something else on her mind, too. Even on the quizzes, she'd throw in an extra credit quiz about what are the five names of the space shuttle. So we always, we always knew her interest in, uh, in space was high. McAuliffe's crewmates have graded her well, acknowledging theirs will always be known as the teacher mission. And she hopes the lesson about space travel on the shuttle will not just be for youngsters. People actually, adults have asked me, how many stops is that shuttle going to make? Um, you know, bring, bring me back a moon rock. It's the kind of misinformation Krista McAuliffe wants to correct. And it's why the high school teacher from New England won't be watching the next space shuttle launch. She'll be on it. Lynn Schur, ABC News, Concord, New Hampshire. They are off. A reminder, she goes up on Sunday as kid. And as the Challenger roars off the pad Sunday morning, it'll be carrying a cargo looking a great deal like what might be on your breakfast plate right now. CNN's Tom Mintier reports from Louisville, Kentucky. While it may look like an ordinary egg you might fry in the skillet for breakfast, it isn't. These eggs are headed for a trip on the Space Shuttle Challenger to space. John Bellinger, a 20-year-old Purdue University student, is the keeper of the eggs. He was selected by NASA in 1983 for his science experiment to study the effects of weightlessness on developing embryos. Bellinger's curiosity about eggs began as a high school freshman. You know, I was thinking, if man is going to space, you know, for the future, what is this weightless environment going to do? Is man, can man have children in space? What began as a basic birds and the bees question soon expanded to include questions like, would a space chicken look or taste different? Kentucky Fried Chicken decided to sponsor Bellinger's project, and he now conducts his research in a laboratory at the Chicken Conglomerate's International Headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky. A total of 32 eggs will make the trip to space. Originally, Bellinger's project would carry a single egg. But when you receive a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, you take advantage of it. With each design modification, the experiment grew. The eggs will be all fertilized and hatch about a week after the space shuttle returns. But how the eggs react to near-zero gravity will be the key. On Earth, we have gravity, which causes the yolk to fall to the bottom of the egg. In space, the yolk will be in a more suspended, more natural, more neutral position. And my hypothesis states that this will produce a more positive growth effect. In other words, we'll have a better type of chicken produced. While the 32 eggs fly in space, an identical number in a control experiment on Earth will be studied. Because gravity pulls the yolk to the bottom, they will have to be rotated by hand. The astronauts will check the space eggs daily and ensure the moisture sponges on board the experiment don't dry out. The egg crate has already been tested on NASA's vibration table and launch simulator. Not a single egg cracked, and John Billinger says all hatched normally. With Kentucky Fried Chicken involved in the project, some might wonder if the hatched space chickens will wind up smothered in the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. The answer is no. Half the eggs will go to the lab for yolk studies, and the other 16 will be allowed to hatch and achieve space celebrity status, ensuring them a long and pampered life on Earth. If John Bellinger's experiment is successful, that age-old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, will have a new answer. In space, the egg, of course. Tom Intier, CNN, Louisville, Kentucky. For liftoff, Sunday morning at 9.36 a.m. Eastern Time with teacher Krista McAuliffe aboard. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready to have two lessons in my life. I've been preparing these since September, and I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. At uh, Cape Canaveral, Christy McAuliffe, a teacher from New Hampshire, is completing her preparations today for a flight in space. She'll be in the shuttle Challenger, which is scheduled to lift off Sunday morning. Among other things, she'll give two lessons from space, which will be broadcast live to schoolrooms across the country. Weather conditions are improving slightly. NASA officials now believe they will be able to launch tomorrow and avoid those embarrassing weather delays that plagued the last flight of the shuttle. Right now, things look good. And I just hope the weather outside uh, continues to cooperate with us. Meteorologists are releasing weather balloons regularly, checking the upper atmosphere. Rains are expected during the night, but the forecast calls for clearing in the morning. There is a chance of some fog, 
but it should burn off before the beginning of the window. The first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe and her six crewmates, spent most of the day reviewing flight plans. McAuliffe's parents say the 37-year-old New Hampshire school teacher remains calm, but they admitted they were not. I'm starting to get a little knot in my stomach right now. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be later. We're getting a little bit of trepidation as we're getting closer and closer. But as for their daughter, she's just anxious to go. Mm -hmm. This will be the first launch from the newly refurbished Pad 39B since a joint U.S.-Russian space probe 10 years ago. NASA hopes the second launch pad will keep periodic weather and technical delays from disrupting the space agency's tight, ambitious flight schedule. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center. The countdown is continuing smoothly, and the shuttle crew is preparing for the mission, but the forecast may get in the way of a successful liftoff. A cold front from Texas is expected to move through Florida just about launch time. It may bring clouds and rain. If Challenger does get off the ground, it will be a history-making voyage carrying the first teacher in space. Shirley McNerney has more on teacher Krista McAuliffe. Krista McAuliffe is now at the Kennedy Space Center. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready to have two lessons in my life. I've been preparing Officially, Krista is now in quarantine, only allowed to see members of her family, and only after they have first seen a doctor. How's Krista doing? She is so excited and happy and relaxed and all, the whole good feeling. Do you have a little bit of uh, trepidation? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, as the day comes closer, I feel a little bit more. But particularly now when the, uh, the Columbia went up, I have watched them all go up and thought it was wonderful, got excited. But when I saw that take out, my stomach just came up and went back down. That never happened before. The Space Shuttle Challenger itself is now out on Pad B, surrounded by a revolving service structure. When the actual launch takes place, Krista's husband and children will watch from the roof of the Launch Control Center. Krista's backup, teacher Barbara Morgan, taught one of the live PBS Mission Watch programs for children. As for Krista herself, she went flying on an STA, a shuttle training aircraft which simulates landing. Her pilot, Ken Baker, a future astronaut. Did she seem nervous or anything? No. Nope. Seemed to have a good time. CNN will have live coverage of the shuttle launch scheduled tomorrow morning about 9.30 Eastern Time. That's 6.30 out west. Good evening and welcome to the Weekend Report. I'm Lisa Schweitzer at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the countdown continues for tomorrow's launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger with its crew of seven, including New Hampshire school teacher Krista McCollum. But a cloudy and rainy forecast is threatening tomorrow's launch, and officials here are keeping their fingers crossed. We've established a meeting this afternoon, or this evening, I should say, at 9.30 to assess the weather uh, before we tank, uh, start loading fuel into the external tank. When the Challenger finally does lift off, it will spend a week in space. And while most of the attention is on the space teacher, there are also six other astronauts on board. I feel very fortunate to be on, on flight with the, this crew, but there's a lot of difference between a payload specialist or a space participant and an astronaut. I mean, they go through years of training, and I've had a glimpse of a lot of the things that they've done, but um, I do not understand an awful lot that goes on aboard the shuttle. Challenger's crew will deploy a tracking satellite and observe Halley's Comet. They'll also oversee an Indiana College student's prize-winning experiment measuring weightlessness on embryo development using chicken eggs. It took me three times before I ever became a national winner. And maybe it would take you four or five, but just think that one time my ship came back home, look what it's done for me. You know, I'll be able to say, hey, I have a project on the space shuttle. But for the non-scientists, the draw of this mission is McCulloch. This Girl Scout troop from South Carolina raised $2,000 to see a former Girl Scout lift off into space. We're going to stay and watch it go off. And no matter what the weather? No matter what. <laughs> If the weather cooperates, the New Hampshire school teacher and the rest of the crew will lift off at 9.36 tomorrow morning. Excited, thrilled, tense, little tense, starting to get a little nervous. It may be nerve-wracking waiting for NASA to send your wife into space, but when it's your mother, that's another story. Krista's son Scott confided to me he's a bit bored by all the fuss. He's really looking forward to going to Walt Disney World in a few days. Scott told me he also wouldn't mind a vacation out of the country. His sister Caroline simply ducks out of the way of the camera. It's not easy when mom is doing something no other private citizen has done before. Steve, most of us look at this and see history being made. Do you ever think of Krista's place in history? I do. I really, yeah, I really do. It's, uh, 
you know, Chris is well aware of the fact that she's she's not going up because she's who she is. She's going up as a representative, and so we're both very aware that she's representing ordinary people, and it's it's a new age. I mean, ordinary people are going into space tomorrow. I think that's great. So do all the people at this reception, thrown by three crew members. Several hundred friends of Krista's, also astronaut Greg Jarvis and Commander Dick Scobies, are here to relax the night before the launch. The family's also here, trying hard to relax. So we're trying to have everybody write a note in the book so she can have it. That their thoughts have been with her anyway, even though she can't be here. But all the rest of the family is. So everyone is just waiting for the liftoff. But there is still the chance weather could force a delay. Steve told me that wouldn't bother him a bit. They don't delay it unless there's, it's not perfect, and that's fine with me. I, I, I'd be much happier if it went up when everybody thought it was perfect than to go up on a chance basis. Tonight, Space Shuttle Challenger on Launch Pad 39B as the Mammoth spacecraft is prepared for liftoff. Crews were expected to begin loading some 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and oxygen into the external fuel tank, the large, expandable, torpedo-shaped object the shuttle is attached to. Earlier today, Air Force meteorologists predicted clouds and possible rain for tomorrow, forcing NASA officials to consider delaying the liftoff. Uh, as far as the teacher in space activities, I don't really think we get into a problem with her, with her lessons until we slip two days, I believe, and we work some contingency plans in the event uh, that were to happen so that uh, uh, Krista will be able to teach from space uh, during a school day. As NASA ground crews prepared the shuttle for launch, Krista McCoff and the rest of the crew remain near their quarters away from their families. Her schedule today, last-minute briefings, medical examinations, and just relaxing. Tonight, as he tried to relax, the space teacher's husband, Stephen, said a delay wouldn't bother him a bit. A delay? I'd, I'd be thrilled if there was a delay. I was saying to somebody the other day, if they don't delay it unless there's, it's not perfect, then that's fine with me. I, I, I'd be much happier if it went up when everybody thought it was perfect, then they go up on a chance basis. <laughs> Joining me live now is Jim Mizell, public affairs officer with NASA. Jim, how does the liftoff look for Monday morning? How does the weather look? The front is going to move through this area very rapidly tomorrow, bringing overcast clouds with a lot of rain, and we're expecting this to clear up Monday and have great weather for the launch. Is the launch a go for Monday, or will there be decisions to be made yet? We have a meeting at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon to discuss things such as decisions to be made, such as the weather. Right now, we think that the weather is going to be great for Monday. Okay, very briefly, if you can, tell our viewers why rain is a problem. A lot of people don't understand that. Well, the shuttle has heat-resistant tiles on the bottom, and these are like eggshells. They're very fragile to breaking, and the rain acts like BBs or shotgun pellets on the bottom of the orbit at the speed of sound as it climbs out of uh, Kennedy Space Center. Jim, you've been involved in an awful lot of these launches. How does the crew take a delay like this? Well, the crew is trained for this. They're very professional, and uh, they take it in stride. Uh, several of them are test pilots, so they're very familiar with uh, delays. Will Krista and her crew know tonight that there has been a delay? No, they want to sleep at their regular time tonight, and they won't be awakened until their regular time tomorrow morning in order not to break their sleep cycle that they use on the mission. Okay, so they will find out in the morning. That's correct. They will find out in the morning, and work will be set aside for them to do. The commander will go out and probably fly if the weather is good enough to fly, and everyone will study their plans for the mission. Will this one-day delay be a problem for future missions? No, this particular mission will not bother the next one, as we are now checking out the other spaceship in the orbit processing facility now. So they will just move the landing down one day, and the mission will probably last the same amount of time. Okay, all the activities that are scheduled during, during this mission will just be moved back one day we on the same time a, schedule. A 24-hour uh, slip is what it amounts to. Okay, Jim Mizell, thanks very much for joining us okay. this evening. Okay, Sharon, there you have the story. The launch is now set for 9.37. NASA officials believe it will be a go. We'll know definitely tomorrow. I'm Lauren Baker reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center. Jim, uh, you were in contact with the people at the meeting. Tell us the details on the weather and how that will, could affect the space shuttle flight. Well, the ceilings were lowering in tomorrow morning about 5 o'clock, and the clouds were coming in. They were going to have thunderstorms and rain. The space shuttle cannot go up through the rain at the speed of sound due to the heat-resistant tiles on the bottom. We're always interested in the safety of the flight crew and the safety of the shuttle, so based on those considerations, we decided to reschedule until Monday morning. Is the crew aware of the delay? The crew is asleep at the present time. They'll be awakened at their regular time, and of course, uh, they will then find out that they're going to have to wait 24 more hours before they go. It's going to be a big, big disappointment when they find out.
Thank you very much, Jim Mizell, the spokesman here at NASA. Once again, the Space Shuttle Challenger flight has been delayed till 9.37 in the morning on Monday. We will have more information and briefings tomorrow. Reporting live at the Kennedy Space Center, this is Byron Barnett, the New England News. Shuttle crew is clearing the path for space travel for years to come. They'll deploy a tracking and data relay satellite. There's already one in orbit. And this second one will allow NASA to keep in contact with the shuttle virtually all the time. Future satellites will be designed based on what's learned during this mission. Astronaut Greg Jarvis will be running experiments to see if the amount of liquid fuel in a satellite, or the sloshing around of fuel, makes satellites less stable and thus unusable in orbit. There'll be plant experiments to learn more about growing food in space. Okay, we've come a long way from the Wright Brothers plane to the shuttle. And for the first time, a classroom in space. History teacher Krista McAuliffe will be making history herself as she teaches two classes from the orbiter. The first will be a televised field trip through the shuttle. The second, explaining the importance of exploring space. In addition, she'll be filming six other lessons to be shown to students when the shuttle returns to Earth. While most of the shuttle's work is aimed at the future, they'll also be paying some attention to the past, studying the creation of the universe by taking a closer look at Halley's Comet. Astronaut Judy Resnick will set a satellite outside the shuttle where it will study the vapors that create the comet's tail. After a couple of days of comet watching, the Spartan Halley satellite will be brought back in. But it won't be all work on this mission, at least if astronaut Ron McNair has anything to say about it. I'm going to find me a window, perch in that window, grab me a camera, put my music on, and just watch the world go by. And that... The forecast is for several layers of cloud cover over the Cape tomorrow morning. NASA will not complete the fueling process unless the weather improves, even though that may mean postponing the launch until Monday. We'll sit on the ground until the we all believe it's uh, safe to launch. When they do get into space, the crew will deploy two satellites, one to help NASA communicate with orbiting shuttles, and one to study Halley's Comet as it passes near the sun. This will be known forever as the teacher flight, because President Reagan said back when he was seeking re-election, we ought to put a teacher in space. NASA agreed, spent 10 months trying to find the appropriate candidate, and because she is a civilian, a private citizen, she's drawn a lot more attention around here than the astronaut members of the crew. At this time, I'd like to introduce you or to a, perhaps the person you, you came to see, and that's uh, Krista McAuliffe, our payload specialist, teacher in space. <laughs> she is 37 and teaches history in a high school in Concord, New Hampshire. So she will here. conduct two lessons Watch from space during the flight. I've been preparing these in September, and I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. McAuliffe was selected over 11,000 teachers who applied for this mission. She's been showing her family around the office, the cargo bay, where she'll work during the flight. NASA plans to take reporters and other non-astronauts on future flights, encouraged by the teachers' reaction to weightlessness. Oh, that's great! I love it! Steve alive. This is Daybreak Sunday on CNN for January 26, 1986, with Atlanta. Bad weather is blamed for a delay in the launch of Space Shuttle Challenger. It was supposed to lift off today, but NASA postponed the launch until tomorrow because the forecast calls for fog, rain, and clouds near the Kennedy Space Center. Challenger is now set to head into space at 9.37 a.m. Eastern Time, 6.37 Pacific Time tomorrow. When the shuttle does get off the ground, it will be carrying the first teacher nod, Krista McAuliffe. She's the subject of a great deal of attention, as CNN's John Zarella reports from the Kennedy Space Center. Everyone is here to see Sharon Krista McAuliffe, the Massachusetts woman chosen to be the first teacher in space, has become an instant celebrity. Thousands of school children, teachers, and well-wishers packed the Kennedy Space Center this weekend in anticipation of the big event. Two of Krista's jogging partners and fellow Massachusetts teachers came to see their colleague make history. They think McAuliffe's experience is more than just media hype and will have a positive effect on the teaching profession. Well, we hope it's positive and gets more uh, individuals interested in the teaching profession, and we hope that it improves our salary. These four-year-olds, members of the Royal Rangers Tenderpaws from Orlando, came for the launch, along with a Girl Scout troop from Hilton Head, South Carolina. 
And of course, there are Krista's relatives, cousin Marsha Murphy from Fort Lauderdale and cousin Fred Tabshe from Nebraska, along with dozens of others from all across America. These people are almost as excited about McAuliffe's trip what about as she Krista is. Herself? Unbelievable. <laughs> what can you say? Unbelievable. Great, great person. And they made a good choice. I don't think NASA could have done a better job. I think it's wonderful that she's representing all the teachers of America and the people that maybe didn't think the teaching profession was such a wonderful thing to go into. Amidst all this hoopla, one mustn't forget that teacher McAuliffe is more than just going on a joyride. She will perform experiments that will demonstrate the effects of microgravity on hydroponics, experiments on magnetism, Newton's law, effervescence, and chromatography. All of McAuliffe's experiments will be filmed for use after the flight in classrooms on Earth. But there is no way of escaping the fact that Krista McAuliffe has become America's newest hero. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The launch crew didn't even bother loading the fuel on the shuttle for today's scheduled launch. The gloomy weather prompted NASA to decide late last night to postpone the flight. School teacher Krista McAuliffe will be a passenger on this mission. She'll teach two lessons to students in hundreds of schools from her orbiting classroom. As all systems go for the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger in just a couple of hours, the ship was to have left the pad at Florida's Kennedy Space Center yesterday. Clouds and the threat of thunderstorms stopped it. Now today there are some gusty winds at the launch site and a question about weather at an emergency landing site. But the crew still plans to leave Earth at 9.37 a.m. Eastern Time, 6.37 Pacific. And of course, CNN will bring you live coverage. School teacher Christy McAuliffe will be aboard. She'll give two televised lessons from space to Earthbound students. This is Daybreak on CNN for Monday, January 27th. With Reed Collins in Washington and Marianne Laughlin and Bob Kane. Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Space Shuttle Challenger is poised for liftoff in just over two and a half hours from now. This excursion into near space has been delayed for five days by several factors. Yesterday it was a bad weather forecast, although that turned out to be wrong. This morning there's some concern about high altitude winds, but the countdown continues. This is the tenth trip into space for the shuttle Challenger. The crew includes the first teacher not, educator Krista McAuliffe, is to conduct classes from space during the mission. CNN will carry the launch live whenever. Liftoff is set for 9.37 a.m. Eastern Time. That's 6.37 on the West Coast. It's Mr. McAuliffe, a New Hampshire school teacher. More on the flight now and this report from Steve Delaney. Steve, good morning. Good morning, John. Two hours and 11 minutes from now, the Challenger will lift off if everything goes well, and there's now no indication that it won't go well. The uh, Challenger mission L-51 has been delayed a couple of times. There have been a lot of delays this month in the, in the space program and its manned uh, efforts to put the shuttles up and bring them back down again. And they're beginning to wonder now whether they're going to be able to make the planned uh, 15 launches that they have in mind for this year. Everything is beginning to slow down just a bit. But there are no technical and, uh, problems this morning. The crew is on its way out to the launch pad where they'll be loaded up and get ready to go and as john mentioned krista mcauliffe is going to be uh, the star of this uh, of this particular flight the school teacher from new hampshire is going to be delivering two lessons from space one just a kind of a guided tour of the vehicle and one concentrating on what we've all learned from the space program over the past uh, many years that it's been running here from Cape Canaveral. We'll be, um, we'll be watching it go in about two hours from now. There are no problems with the mechanics. There is some concern about the winds aloft, but apparently not enough to slow down the count. John? Thanks, Steve. Challenger carrying New Hampshire school teacher Krista McAuliffe among its crew of seven. McAuliffe planning to conduct two televised classrooms from the shuttle's orbiting classroom. It uh, evidently has a stripped screw that is stuck, and they're going to have to drill it out. Uh, they've also had some problems with the micro switches around the hatch not sealing properly. They opened it several times. One crew member uh, from the closeout team went inside and uh, worked on the hatch at that point, and they are now drilling out the handle. The handle is only used on the ground, and they will have to take that handle off and put the insulation on before they can fly. They are at T minus nine minutes and holding now, holding for a break in the weather. It is a scheduled 10 minute hold, but they're hoping that the problems with the weather will clear up, and they are also hoping that they can get this handle off to allow them, hopefully, to launch on time. A little earlier this morning, they paid homage to the teacher that is going into space. There you see the mortarboard and one of the members of the closeout crew. 
saluting the teacher, Krista McAuliffe, as she comes up to go inside Challenger for her trip to space. There you see her. She will be the uh, first teacher to travel into space and will have uh, classrooms going on from the space shuttle that uh, will now occur a little later than originally scheduled. And, uh, but we are waiting now for the problems with the hatch to be cleared up. You can see uh, the handle right on the right-hand side of the hatch uh, that they're going to be using a drill. They have all the equipment up there, but it's simply a matter of uh, taking that handle off and removing the closeout crew. Normally, these people would be... The well, screw um, is stripped on a handle that is supposed to come out before the space shuttle can take off. They have to put some insulation on that door you see there. They're waiting now for a drill and the proper bits to drill the screw off the handle so they can remove the handle and go ahead and put the insulation on. They estimate that they may be 25 minutes to one hour in doing that work. Now, the race is on with the weather. Right now, the weather is acceptable at the, the pad area after they finish taking the handle off. NASA estimates the work time, 25 minutes to one hour. We, of course, will continue an hour ago, a little over it, actually. Let's go down now live to the Kennedy Space Center and take a look at what they're doing. They're still working on the door. They managed to get the handle off about 15 minutes ago that was stuck in place after a screw strip. They drilled the screw out were able to take the handle off. Now they're going to have to go ahead and put the thermal protection cover over the hatch and clear out the people that are in the white room. But another thing that's going to delay it even longer, they're resetting the clock now to 20 minutes and they will add an additional hour to the countdown time because they have to do some resetting of the computers. So as it stands now, at least another hour before they could even begin to think about launching. And at 12.07 Eastern Standard Time, they will close out the window. That will be the last chance unless they can possibly extend it even further, which that is not likely. So the handle is off. They are proceeding with work on the pad, but it will take at least another hour before they can even think about launching Challenger. So the delays continue at the Kennedy Space Center. We will continue to update you on the situation. In the news headlines this morning, the weather outlook's favorable, although some high-level winds are causing a bit of concern as NASA gets ready to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger less than two hours from now. The seven-person crew includes that New Hampshire school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space. The Space Shuttle Challenger is preparing now to lift off about an hour and a half from now to carry the first school teacher into space. Let's go to CNN's Tom Mateer in Atlanta for an update on the mission and the countdown. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Reed. They're watching the weather very closely at the Kennedy Space Center, not so much the weather on the ground, but the weather a few thousand feet up in the air. Some very strong winds, upper-level winds at the Kennedy Space Center. They've been sending up several weather balloons to take a look at uh, those winds aloft. But the crew has been put inside of Challenger. They loaded the last crew member about 10 minutes ago. They are now uh, preparing to close the hatch. This is Krista McAuliffe, uh, the first private citizen ever to travel in space, as she suited up uh, about a half hour ago for uh, her entry into Challenger. They will sit there until 9.37, about an hour and 35 minutes from now before their scheduled takeoff time. However, NASA has three hours where they can stretch the launch window out to hopefully get a better weather prognosis from the skies. And the launch time again, 9.37 Eastern Standard Time. That is when the 25th shuttle mission is scheduled to go. Let's take a check now with CNN meteorologist Nick Gregory at what the weather situation is at the Kennedy Space Center right now. Nick? Well, Tom, as we saw by the live shot there just a moment ago, and we'll confirm that by the satellite picture, just a few clouds here and there, but nothing really too serious. The Cape is right over this region. We don't expect a lot of cloudiness or a lot of bad weather at the surface of the Earth. But as you get up into the upper atmosphere, here's where we have some trouble because we've got cold air rushing in across the southeast. The winds are blowing very strongly from the west to northwest uh, at speeds of 150 miles per hour or greater, let's say, or more than that, above, let's say, 20 to 30,000 feet in the atmosphere. So you go from a surface wind of about 10 miles an hour up to a wind at 30,000 feet of 150 miles an hour, and that's something NASA does not like to travel through. So we'll be keeping you posted on the wind situation through the morning. Space Shuttle Challenger is to lift off about an hour from now. There was some concern over high winds over the Cape for a time, but NASA officials do expect to launch on time. The seven-member crew this time includes the first teacher who will hold some class from space. Bruce Hall has the latest on today's high-tech, low comedy. 
We are going to scrub for today. And the and, confidence uh, in NASA's ability to maintain a launch schedule has been rocked by this series of embarrassing uh, technical snafus and weather delays. Well, of course, it was just not our day. And it has not been NASA's month. In early January, it took seven attempts to get Columbia and her crew into orbit, and there were two delays getting them back. And this week's effort to get Challenger into orbit has turned into a comedy of errors. Sunday's launch was canceled when rain was predicted. But by lunchtime, the skies were clear and the weather ideal. NASA admitted they goofed. Today, the trouble started with the shuttle's door. The problem is that only one of the micro switches on the door indicates it's closed. Technicians tried to remove the door's handle, but failed because a small screw was stuck. So the call went out for a drill. When it finally arrived, 35 minutes later, the batteries were too weak to operate it. The proper drill has now arrived in the white room. And but the bit on the new drill crumbled. Finally, a hacksaw was brought in to cut off part of the handle. But by this time, the winds had picked up at both the launch pad and the emergency landing site. Currently, those winds are in excess of acceptable limits. After another two-hour wait, the seven weary astronauts climbed out of the shuttle and were told with NASA's tight 1986 schedule, they will try again tomorrow. But the forecast calls for freezing temperatures that could cause another postponement. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. But this morning, the handle would not budge. Okay, uh, we got a problem on removing one of the screws on the milk stool. It seems to be uh, stripped. NASA workmen called for a power drill to unscrew the latch altogether. When the drill finally arrived an hour later, its batteries were dead. So the workmen finally decided to pull out a hacksaw. By the time the handle was sawed off, clouds and gusty winds had moved over the launch pad. Conditions unacceptable for liftoff. We have scrubbed the launch attempt for today. Despite the scrub, the crew, including school teacher Krista McAuliffe, were reported in good spirits, but not the visiting school children from McAuliffe's hometown. I was disappointed. I was really mad that it didn't go off. NASA will try again for a launch tomorrow morning, but tonight a hard freeze is predicted that could damage water and fuel lines on the launch pad and further delay Challenger's liftoff. John Quinones, ABC News, the Kennedy Space Center. At Cape Canaveral today, the space shuttle Challenger ran into still more problems and that forced still another delay in efforts to put the first school teacher into space. The flight of Krista McAuliffe now has been put off five times. And NBC's Dan Molina reports tonight, there are worries that it may be put off again tomorrow. In the end, it was a stiff Florida wind that kept Challenger on the launch pad today. Winds like this would have made an emergency landing very dangerous. It all started out well. Teacher Krista McCullough and her crewmates marched up to the launch pad in the pre-dawn hours. Up at Krista's school in Concord, New Hampshire, they crowded into the cafeteria to watch the big event on television. Then came the exasperating mishap. A handle attached to the outside of the shuttle's hatch had to be unscrewed and removed before takeoff as usual. Today, the threads of one screw were stripped. The call went out for the tools any home handyman would use, a big drill and a hacksaw. They went through two drills, they broke a drill bit. Finally, they got the handle off, but by then the wind had kicked up. We are going to scrub for today and we'll be letting the crew out of the orbiter and they will go back to the crew quarters. The crowd at the launch pad left. As to the students up in New Hampshire... We're getting tired of it. <laughs> we wanted to hurry up and go up so you know, we can find out what it's going to be really like. Maybe we'll get out of more school <laughs> if it's not until Thursday. So. I think everybody's disappointed. All this after NASA canceled yesterday's scheduled launch because the weather forecast looked bad, but turned out fine. Now the plan is to press ahead with yet another try tomorrow, but sub-freezing temperatures are forecast and that could cause all sorts of problems. Dan Molina, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. Shuttle Challenger was set to launch a little after 8.30 Houston time. Members of the launch pad crew, including one who wore a mortarboard and tassel in honor of teacher Krista McAuliffe, greeted the astronauts as they boarded the shuttle shortly before 7.00. At that point, everything was going smoothly. Good morning, Krista, and have a fun flight. Even the weather at the Cape and at potential landing sites around the world seem to be cooperating. Roger, nice, cool and clear. 
But the trouble began when the ground crew tried to close the hatch. The handle is supposed to come off after the hatch is sealed, only it did not. A bolt was screwed in too tightly and wouldn't budge. So began the frustration for the Challenger crew as ground crew members tried to get the bolt loose. We are working on it. Okay. The ground crew sent for a drill and a hacksaw. A half hour later, the drill arrived. But that only brought more frustration. It had a dead battery. After more waiting, the hacksaw arrived at the pad and the ground crew was finally able to remove the handle. But because of the delay, the shuttle Challenger had to wait again. This time, so that navigation equipment could be recalibrated to compensate for the later launch time. That took an hour, long enough for another problem at the Cape, weather. That left the astronauts sitting on the pad again. So we hope between now and one o'clock we'll get a good shot at it, but uh, it doesn't look promising at this moment. Strong winds swept the Cape. Some gusts of more than 30 miles an hour were recorded. That is unacceptable for NASA because it is too rough for an emergency landing at the Cape if the shuttle should have to make an immediate return. And finally, the mission was called off for at least another day. We are going to scrub for today. The Challenger crew left the shuttle disappointed. There is some chance of a launch tomorrow, but at this point, it looks like Florida may be in for some record cold temperatures. That could cause yet another delay in the launch. That will be decided tonight. Nancy Holland, 11 News. In Houston, Nancy Holland for CBS News. We're at Kennedy Space Center caused this morning's delay. You can probably tell the winds are still with us. In fact, they're picking up and the temperatures are beginning to fall. This is not typical Florida weather and this is not good news for NASA. What started off as really a beautiful day, all in all, when you consider it today, it has been a day that's been filled with plenty of disappointment. And the temperatures are only expected to be in the 20s tomorrow morning. The coldest they have ever launched a shuttle before tomorrow will be 40 degrees. So this will be the first time that NASA has attempted at launching a shuttle at, in sub-freezing temperatures. They're still hopeful, but they were hopeful again today. They said they'll just wait and see how the temperatures fall tonight and hope that there'll be some sort of warm-up by tomorrow morning. Reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center, I'm Liz Gonzalez. Let's go to Chris, who's at the Museum of Science, with more on the space shuttle program. Chris. On drill, NASA engineers repaired the door, but not before bad weather moved in once again. For the second time in as many days, NASA was at the mercy of Mother Nature. Another try is scheduled for tomorrow, a day predicted to be the coldest in Florida this season. Also, the major concern, other than getting the recycle completed in the time available, is the temperature. The weather forecast calls for us going below freezing at approximately midnight dropping a degree to two degrees an hour until around sunrise and they're looking for a low temperature somewhere in the low 20s. The astronauts in Krista were naturally disappointed by the delay, but so were thousands who would come to witness the flight. Among the disappointed, third grade classmates of Krista's son, Scott. Well, I, I wish that they could have the launch, but they can't and I just hope we can stay tomorrow till tomorrow to see it. Well, I just don't feel like going home until I see the liftoff. That's what you came down for. Yeah. It includes a trip into space for school teacher Krista McCollum. Monday's attempt was scrubbed by trouble with a door handle. Steve Delaney is at Cape Canaveral this morning. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Bob. It is cold here. It is long john weather at the Cape. NASA has had launches in sub-freezing weather before, but never from the shuttle program. And there is some concern about the effect of these cold temperatures. Primarily, they're looking at a buildup of ice on the outside of the external fuel tank, which is loaded with hydrogen and oxygen at very low temperatures. Meanwhile, the crew is going through the routine of having breakfast just before they take them out to the pad. This will be the second countdown for what's going to be known as the teacher flight because it will feature lessons to be taught a little bit later by Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from New Hampshire. And this is a, a departure for NASA because this will be the first time that a real person, if you'll pardon me, will be allowed to participate in one of these flights and it portends more of 
availability of flights for common, ordinary citizens, and it kind of demystifies and takes some of the mystique away from the old astronaut tradition. So a lot of people around the country are going to be watching this one if it gets off today, as they sincerely hope it does, because the longer they delay it, the more they throw the whole schedule for the year off, and it's already a bit behind. Bob? Steve, thank you. It's 707. Jane? Uh, thank you, Bob, and it's good to see you again. We haven't, and uh, I haven't had a chance to ask how Antarctica was. I'm not sure I have the superlatives to describe it, but we have, have brought back some tape, which you'll be seeing beginning next week. Oh, really? New Orleans was nice, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. If he wants to relive his past, that article, all he's got to do is go out to Fifth Avenue right now. Yeah, it's chilly. It's part of it. Yeah, i got to say, what a beautiful time again, the people of New Orleans. If New it, Orleans is a wonderful If it place. flew, crawled, walked, or swam, we ate it. There was something we missed down there. I've always wanted to do this in the weather business for 35 years, and I can do it this morning and give you some facts behind it. This morning it is Tupelo in Tupelo, Mississippi. No, you're making that. No. Winds, good morning, gentlemen. Yeah. I like to see these guys fight. Give me along in a minute. That's right, Tupelo, Mississippi. The wind chill is two below this morning. It is cold outside. We've got a little better news in the latest update from our cracked weather team upstairs. Citrus Belt was hit, no question about it, but 26 degrees was the official low in Orlando, and that's about the heart of the Citrus Belt. South of there, everything was in better shape. They got the word out, and the warning was okay, so that I think most people could protect themselves. However, north of Orlando, there could have been a little bit of a problem. Uh, hopefully, the, everything will work out okay. Love those oranges and tangelos. Out west, it is best this morning. Los Angeles record 87 yesterday. Phoenix 81. Billings, Montana. What is this? Billings was 60. Rapid City, South Dakota, 65. Almost a repeat performance again today. Jet stream fools you out there in California and the western states, but that's the place to go to get warm. It was cool in Florida this morning. It did not get down below 30 degrees. We thought it might. It, uh, Miami International Airport did get down, I believe, to 39 degrees this morning. We Windshield factor there was about 20. That's still cooling up. It is cold. We have biggest problem here in the northeast this morning is blowing and drifting and the windshield. It is bitter cold. We have blowing and drifting snow. They had four to six inches of that snow. And they're icy roads, so be very careful. Maine will get some more snow today, four to six additional inches. But all throughout New England, the Ohio Valley, all the way down through the mid-Atlantic states, look out if you're traveling by car. Especially, you could have some uh, rough roads because of icy conditions. Another Alberta clipper zipping into the nation's midsection, bringing more cold weather as the week uh, winds down or gets underway or whatever I'm trying to say as it continues. <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. Hello. Hello, Earth. 74, Midland, Odessa. Going to be a great day today. So the western states are fabulous. The southern central plains are great. And more wet weather in the northwest. Here's what's happening in your world this morning. It's half past the hour now, and in the news headlines this morning, NASA technicians are working in a freezing Florida cold this morning, preparing the Space Shuttle Challenger for liftoff again, about three hours away now. This flight, Challenger's 10th, includes the crew member, Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher to go into space, if she goes. Now, speaking of warming up, we hope temperatures will warm up for this, the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. They're getting ready uh, again to go off on about 10.38 Eastern time this morning is the scheduled launch time. They had uh, some trouble again with uh, one of the computer systems earlier uh, this morning and had to sort of postpone the launch another hour or so or delay it about an hour. And then they were concerned about the cold temperatures. There had been some icy areas uh, reported uh, on some of the launch uh, site region. But other than that, things should be returning to near normal conditions, we think, by mid-morning. And thus, uh, the launch should go off without a hitch, at least from the weather angle. Freezing temperatures dogged NASA through the night as launch crews prepared the shuttle Challenger for a later this morning. Yesterday, a stubborn hatch cover, then worsening weather, scrubbed the liftoff after several hours of waiting. No waiting for the Florida citrus grower, who also worked through this night, spraying crops against the cold and running the smudge pots. It's the third year running that a wedge of freezing air has threatened these Florida crops. Well, if a shuttle could shiver, the Challenger would, warmed only by the blusters of NASA left over from yesterday's comedy of the hatch cover. Tom and Tier is live in Atlanta. Tom, it's try harder again this morning? It's try hard and fight the elements. Right now, the seven members of the Challenger crew are on their way to the pad in the center of your picture. You can see the Astro van. There is no ice on the highways down there. But it is just 24 degrees at the launch pad, and that has definitely caused them some problems this morning. They predicted as early as Sunday it was going to be very cold today. If they were unable to lift off yesterday, they knew they had weather problems today. NASA says there is no exact amount of temperature that they have to 
scrub under. You see some of the ice uh, down in the uh, area underneath the launch pad. Uh, that's giving them fits right now because they have some air, some water suppression bags down in the bottom. And that's basically how they'll test to see whether they're able to go ahead or not. They'll go down and kick these bags. And uh, if they slush around, it's not frozen, so they will be able to continue. The computer problem that uh, caused them to move the fueling back by one hour uh, was uh, because of the uh, cold temperatures in the area. Here you see the crew just a few moments ago coming out of their crew quarters area for the second time in as many days. But NASA is fairly optimistic this morning. The weather is uh, not a factor except for the temperatures. They uh, have pretty much clear skies in the area as they are uh, now headed out to the launch pad. CNN meteorologist Dick Gregory is here now to uh, take a look at the exact weather uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Nick? And Tom, we're going to look at the latest satellite picture to help us out to do this because we can see that skies are completely clear and the video coming from the Space Center also confirming that to us. Winds are light, so winds will not be a problem, although again, they're a bit on the strong side when you get into the upper atmosphere, but they're still within launch criteria. Still at 24 degrees, although again, with the launch time at about 10.38 Eastern time this morning, we hope that the thermometer will have warmed up to about the freezing mark by then, and also the sunshine will be beating down on the launch pad on the launch site area to help maybe sublimate, in other words, evaporate any of the ice that may be around, uh, let's say, the launch structure itself uh, in uh, that region. So we expect conditions to uh, be within limits, we think, for launch this morning. It's half past the hour, and in the news headlines this morning, with launch time just two hours away now, NASA's keeping a close eye on the weather at the Kennedy Space Center. The thermometer particularly, freezing temperatures a major concern. It was in the low 20s overnight, and NASA wants to make certain ice doesn't form on the Challenger's exterior. Icicles hang from the safety rails on the Space Shuttle Challenger's launch pad, but NASA says the icy weather is not likely to impede today's liftoff scheduled an hour and a half from now. That cold front's making work for NASA's officials a bit unpleasant as the Space Shuttle Challenger tries again about an hour and a half from now to leave the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. Today's launch was pushed back one hour because balky equipment plagued workers before they tried to refuel the shuttle. The teacher, Krista McAuliffe, joins the six-member crew now on the Challenger's mission. She's to teach two lessons to be broadcast to schoolrooms on Earth while the crew will launch a communication satellite, also a space station, provided they get off the ground today. The Challenger crew is set to give it another try this morning. The shuttle is parked at the Kennedy Space Center with the first space teacher on board. Correspondent Tom Mentier is here to give us the very latest on the shuttle's ups and downs, and it's already been delayed again this morning. It was oh. supposed to go off at 10.38, and then 9.38, and then 10.38. 10.38, 11.08. And now, who knows when? The countdown clock at the Kennedy Space Center is frozen at one hour and ten minutes and holding. They are taking a look at ice on the pad. Here you see a live picture from the Kennedy Space Center. This is what it looks like, and it's causing them some great concern. NASA officials now meeting to decide if this might prevent a launch. But as it stands right now, they are still go, but when? That's the big question. As I said, the uh, NASA officials are meeting uh, about this problem. The uh, ice evidently built up overnight and not really sure how much of an effect it will have on the countdown, whether they will continue to try to count down or actually scrub the launch again today. Krista McAuliffe is hoping that the ice will melt beneath her. She boarded the shuttle a while ago. She is sitting waiting as she did yesterday for six hours. Hopefully this time they will be able to go. The launch director, Gene Thomas, told the crew a short time ago, welcome to our northern launch facility. Pad 39B sits about two miles from the uh, Space Center's usual pad, 39A. And uh, the children in New Concord, New Hampshire, are hoping that Krista McAuliffe goes this time. They watched yesterday and it didn't happen, but they are optimistic about today. Um, kind of, but I mean, I'll be real psyched when it goes up, though. I wish it'd go up. I want to see it. <laughs> They are not the only ones that want to see it. All of America is watching and waiting to see if the ice on the pad will ice the shuttle permanently to its structure. Once again, the live picture of the ice buildup. Uh, the countdown has been moved back several times today because of the weather. It is sub-freezing there now and causing uh, some great, great concern about the ice. 
If they do not go today, because they have already fueled the external tanks a second time, they fueled yesterday and again today, and if they are not able to get off today, it will be a 48-hour turnaround, so the earliest they could go if they do not have a liftoff is now set for Thursday, the exact time still to be determined. So once again, the countdown clock is frozen at the Kennedy Space Center, one hour and ten minutes, and the meeting is still going on by NASA officials trying to determine how much of a problem the ice is going to be. We, of course, keep you updated here on CNN of the progress, or lack of it, of Challenger. Cold weather has delayed the launch of the space shuttle Challenger. The main concern now is icicles. Technicians are going out to the launch pad to clear away any dangerous ice. NASA's afraid if icicles break off during liftoff, they could go crashing into Challenger. The latest word is that the next launch try will be at 11.38 Eastern, 8.38 a.m. Pacific time, and CNN will bring you live coverage of that. NASA now hopes to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger about an hour from now. CNN's Tom Mentier joins us now with an update. Will it fly today? Well, if they can get the ice scraped off the windshield of Challenger, there is an ice control team that is now on the way to the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. They're going to knock off the two-foot icicles that are on the pad. Hopefully, that will enable Challenger to break loose from its launch pad and get underway. Uh, they have moved the countdown several times today. Here's a look at what the ice looks like on the pad. Very unusual for the Kennedy Space Center with the temperatures below freezing, 24 degrees this morning when they went out to the pad. There was some concern that these icicles, if the Challenger did launch, would damage the heat tiles underneath it, so they decided to go out and knock them off before they attempt to resume the countdown. The countdown clock is running now. The shuttle sits on the pad, waiting. They have been uh, inside for uh, a few hours this morning, not quite what it was yesterday morning when they were in almost six hours sitting on their back waiting to go. But as it appears now, 11.38 will be the optimum time. Other than the ice, there are no serious weather problems. The winds are calm and the uh, skies are clear. So as it stands right now, 11.38 Eastern time will be the next scheduled launch time unless it's put off again. Molly? Okay, Tom. Wouldn't the, the, the blast off itself with the heat generated make those icicles melt? Well, the, underneath the shuttle is the area where most of the heat comes in, and they do have equipment there to disperse the heat and try to stop the fires. But uh, a lot of the vibration that would occur before it actually leaves the launch pad could take one of those icicles loose and possibly may turn it into a little missile. Well, all we can do is wish them best of luck at this point in time. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to warm up much. It's right now above freezing at the pad, so that will help, but it won't take off the icicles. I have to do that by hand. Okay, thanks. And who would have ever thought that icicles at the Kennedy Space Center would be the cause of a delay in the Challenger in terms of liftoff, but that's how wacky the weather's been this last week or so. With the latest on the uh, situation at the Kennedy Space Center, as well as around the rest of the country, here's CNN's meteorologist, Nick Gregory. Nick, is it warming up down there at all? It's up to 35 degrees now at the launch site uh, area, and the landing site area of the uh, shuttle, Patrick, and uh, we're looking for temperatures to climb into the 40s here this afternoon, but now that they're above freezing and there's a great amount of sunshine, uh, plus they have a team out there working on getting the ice uh, sickles off of uh, the surface structure of the shuttle. So hopefully things will go well for a launch within the next uh, two hours or so. Uh, this, this is the problem we first addressed yesterday because we did expect, again, this very cold air to push all the way in that area. And that was one of the concerns was that how cold would it be? Would it get to a serious freezing situation or not? around the shuttle. And we did think that this was going to happen as it fell to 24 degrees in the area there this morning. So that is certainly significant enough for a freeze. But it didn't last very long, which is good news also for the fruit growers, which made it through this deep freeze pretty well from what we understand, due to the fact that the freezing temperatures did not stay uh, for a prolonged period of time, let's say. They needed to be about four to six hours or more to cause devastating conditions. And it just was not in the mid-20s for that long of a period of time. So that's some good news. Right now, we're going to show you something very unusual. It comes from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and it has to do with the space shuttle, and CNN's Tom Mintier has the very latest on this very unusual occurrence. Tom? Patrick, who would have ever thought there would be icicles hanging from the space shuttle on the launch pad in Florida? But it's something that's occurred this morning. We have something even stranger. Here is a shot we're going to show you of eight members of an ice team. They are working on the launch pad now, clearing away the icicles so they can hopefully go ahead with their scheduled launch time of 11.38 Eastern Time. You can see the uh, men down at the right base of the shuttle.
They are moved into the area. They will stay there probably for the next 10 or 15 minutes, knocking off the icicles that have been on the launch pad. Once again, 11.38 Eastern time. That is the new scheduled time for the launch. We will update you, of course, if that changes. Patrick and Molly? Oh. Tom, thank you very much. I could almost do that. I've gotten some practice the last couple of days. Spray from the old windshield. <laughs> you need a white suit, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's this hour of the Day Watch. Thanks, everybody. I'm Molly McCoy. I'm Patrick Greenlaw. Thank you for watching. Day Watch continues right after this. Good morning. The unseasonably cold weather in Dixie is affecting even the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Its seven-member crew now has been on board since early this morning, waiting for liftoff delayed for more than an hour and a half by technical and then weather-related problems. However, NASA officials say they have determined that icicles on the launch pad do not present any real problem, and they'll attempt to get the shuttle off the ground a little more than half an hour from now. When it finally does lift off, Challenger's mission includes the deployment of a shuttle communications satellite, and the first teacher astronaut, Krista McAuliffe, will give lessons from space, perhaps refrigeration lessons.